And I think it's time to get started. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone who is joining us. We're really excited to have you all here. We know some of you wake up early uh, to watch this, and some people stay up late. So we really appreciate all the, the time that you spend with us. So welcome back to the Water Productivity Masterclass Series. We are in week five of six, and today we'll be discussing the socioeconomics around water productivity. My name is Lauren Zielinski. I work for IHE Delft as part of the Water PIP project team, and I'm joined by Abraham Abishek from Meta Meta, also part of the project team, and we will be moderating today's webinar. If you are new to the webinar series, if this is your first time, I would like to mention that the webinar series is brought to you by the Water PIP project, which stands for Water Productivity Improvement in Practice. And the, the goal of this project is to uh, improve water productivity around the agricultural sector. So it's funded by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and it brings together institutes that focus on water science and water management um, to, to achieve this increase in productivity. So the three main organizations that, that plan and carry out activities are IHE Delft, Institute for Water Education, Wageningen University and Research, and Meta Meta. So you will see many of us kind of in and out of these webinars over the weeks. We are really excited you're all here. I see some of you have already introduced yourselves in the chat, and we're really interested to see who you are. So please put your name, your institute that you work with, and the country that you're from. And it, it helps us understand who our audience is and how to connect with you better. So today is week five out of six. The first week, we discussed the concepts of water productivity and how to monitor water productivity. Weeks two and three, we looked at using the WAPOR portal to monitor water productivity, including using the portal itself online, but also tools like GIS and Python to do different analyses. Last week, we looked at water productivity around sugarcane production and different challenges and opportunities, uh, particularly in, in our case studies in Africa. And then today, we are talking about socioeconomic water productivity with our colleagues from Wageningen. And next week, we will look at monitoring water productivity using AquaCrop, which is another open source software from FAO. If you would like to rewatch today's webinars, or look at webinars from previous weeks, uh, including downloading the presentations, you can go to the project website, which is waterpip.un-ihe.org, or you can go to the waterchannel.tv, and you can find the recordings and presentations there. And we have also joined social media. So if you guys live in the Twitterverse and you would like to follow us, please look up our handle at Water Pip Project on Twitter. And we also started a YouTube uh, channel. So if you are into YouTube and you would like to watch the different videos from these webinars and, and future webinars that we'll do and other activities, uh, you can subscribe to our channel at the Water Pip Project on YouTube. So the agenda today, we will have two colleagues. We'll start with Jeroen Vos, Associate Professor in the Water Resources Management Group at Wageningen. And he will talk about economic water productivity, including a short video um, where he'll introduce social water productivity. And then he'll go into further detail about case studies from Peru and Colombia. And following him, we'll have Maria Christofordu. Uh, she is a research assistant in the Water Resources Management Group as well as Wachemingen. And she will discuss a water productivity assessment framework and then uh, a hypothetical application on how to use that framework. And as always, we'll have the question and answer session at the end. So we will not pause in between the different topics. But if you have comments or questions, please put them in the chat box. Abraham and I will be collecting the questions. And then at the end, in the Q&A session, we'll bring the questions back up and we'll discuss them with our panel. So with that, I think we can start with the presentation from Yerun. Thank you, Lauren. So yeah, hi there all. Nice to see people from very part, from many parts of the world joining. Um, so my name is Jeroen Vos. I work with the Water Resources Management Group at Wageningen, and I'm happy to share some of the results of our research on social water productivity. And actually, what you will see in the slides is that I use 
different terms. Sometimes I talk about social water productivity, sometimes I talk about pro-poor water productivity, and sometimes about social economic. I'll come back to that. If you have any questions, like Lauren said, just put them in the chat, and then I might be able to answer some already during the presentation or otherwise afterwards. So when we talk about water productivity, actually it's good to go and look at the SDG 6.4. Uh, so the sustainability development goals have been set up uh, some decades ago actually to think what should we strive for worldwide uh, in 2030, so in 10 years from now. And uh, the 6.4 is about water productivity. And actually it quite nicely shows two of the uh, goals we have with that. Because the first indicator is about efficiency. The idea of indicator 641 is that we uh, produce food with less water or all the way around, with the same amount of water we produce more food. And why would we do that? Because that is related to the indicator 642, which says that we should have sufficient fresh water available for the ecosystem, for wetlands, for rivers. And the assumption is, and I think it's very good to understand that, that if we are, are more efficient or we have a higher water productivity, we will save water, we will conserve water, so we have more water for the environment. And perhaps that's not always true, but we will come back to that. What I want to do now is zoom out, because water productivity is not only related to SDG 6.4, Actually, it's related to much other national water policy policies and SDGs, like the SDG 1 on poverty, the 2, the second one on uh, zero hunger, and 13, climate action. Because water productivity has also to do with things that happen in climate change. It also is about economic growth. And it's very good to remind us that roughly half of the world's population lives on a daily wage less than two dollars per day. So that's an enormous amount of people and the water productivity and especially social water productivity is related to that as we will see. But if we zoom out a little bit more we see also the social responsibility of the companies and the consumers also related to water productivity. And also inequalities in the world are related to that. And that is actually the core business let's say of social water productivity. Because we have to remind us that uh, on average the income inequality increased by 11% in developing countries uh, from 1990 to 2010. And more than 75% of the population are living today in societies where income is more unequal distributed than it was in the 1990s. And the target for SED 10 is that in 10 years time Progressively, we will achieve an income growth of the bottom 40% of the population at a rate higher than the national average. So, actually making the uh, inequalities less. So, this is uh, how you can see that water productivity and social water productivity is related to these other SDGs. Going back then to the core of water productivity, starting with the idea that Crop water productivity is the yield divided by the water use. But this yield can be expressed in either kilograms per hectare per year or US dollars per hectare per year or kilojoule per hectare per year. And that is important because that has to do with the goal you have when striving for higher water productivity. If we look at economic water productivity, we can say, okay, we concentrate on the US dollars per hectare. You want to see how much economic return is made of a certain amount of water, let's say one cubic meter or a thousand cubic meters. But the question asked with uh, social water productivity is who benefits from this economic returns? Is this, is this a big investment company or is this the workers that work in the field? And there you see the relation with this SDGs that are about reduction of poverty and reduction about reduction of inequality. Okay, to symbolize how money is divided over different stakeholders, you can look at this pineapple. 
And we see that a pineapple, for example, might cost two uh, euros in the supermarket in Europe. And then uh, SOMO did a research and found out that only 4% of the money you pay as a consumer goes to the workers. So you might say, okay, buying the pineapple will help consumers or will help workers, but it's only a, a, a minor percentage. Okay, now we will look at the video, which explains this from the point of view of a of the case study of Peru. In agriculture, water productivity is the amount of value in terms of socio-economic benefits, services and jobs created per unit volume of water consumed. The different stakeholders involved in agriculture receive different proportions of this value. For example, let's look at this pineapple. It was grown at a plantation in Costa Rica and is being sold at a supermarket somewhere in Europe. Research shows that of the revenue from the sale of this pineapple at the supermarket, 21% will go to the plantation. Within that 21%, 17% will go to the plantation owner and 4% to the worker. Social water productivity is an idea that describes how equitable is the distribution of value generated from agricultural output per unit volume of water used. Social water productivity can be used as a parameter for decision making when it comes to allocating the water available in a river basin or an irrigation scheme. For example, in southwestern Peru, a project was proposed to divert annually nearly 300 million cubic meters of water from the mountains, where it was being used by small subsistence farmers, to commercial grapes, asparagus and avocado plantations near the coast. The government initially approved the project on grounds that grapes, asparagus and avocados were high-value export crops and would yield much greater returns per unit volume of water. So this would be a more productive use of water. And this was kind of correct. The net income per 1000 cubic meters of water used for asparagus was around $935 about five times the return from subsistence farming of staple crops such as beans by small farmers in the highlands. But on closer examination it was revealed that plantation owners would have pocketed most of those $935. Plantation workers or small farmers in the area would have earned only $75 per thousand cubic meters of water which is only half the benefits being drawn by farmers in the highlands. This shows that the social water productivity would have been higher if the water was used for smallholder cultivation in the highlands than if it was diverted to plantations on the coast. The discussion around boosting water productivity is invariably a discussion around competing uses and trade-offs. This is especially true in arid or semi-arid countries where water is a scarce resource. For example, for a few years now, Commercial farms are being developed and are expanding rapidly in the middle of Egypt's desert areas, irrigated by fossil groundwater from the Nubian sandstone aquifer system. These commercial farms are highly water intensive. They take a heavy toll on the non-renewable fossil groundwater reserves. Much like the commercial plantations in coastal Peru, the social water productivity of these desert farms is limited. They focus on export crops like Egyptian olives. However, the Center for Environment and Development for the Arab Region and Europe, an intergovernmental organization, recommends that a more socially productive use of this fossil groundwater would be for domestic purposes, such as subsistence farming, and use as a strategic reserve for a growing population. So this video actually explains quite well uh, the overall idea of the pro poor water productivity. And the idea is that in the equitation we would say that what we calculate is the income for the poor people and divided by the water use. This sounds sort of simple, but what we will see when we go uh, into the details of the calculations, we will see it's quite a challenge 
to make these calculations. So let's go back to the example of the video. But let's dive a little bit deeper. So we have this uh, water flowing in the high Andean mountains. Actually, it's diverted because otherwise it would flow to the Amazon basin. It's diverted to go to the Pacific and then uh, be used in the coastal area. The water footprint of a kilogram of grapes, table grapes, is about 680 liters of water. So this project was proposed by the Peruvian government to divide towards this water and as explained in the video that would mean that the water is taken from the high mountains and brought to the coastal area. And like explained in the video, we have 20 times more of a net profit for the owners of the land compared, uh, comparing asparagus with the subsistence subsistence highland agriculture. But actually in the coastal areas the land is not a scarce resource, it's the water. We should look at how much net profit is being made um, from the point of view of water. And then we see still a difference of five times more profit per cubic meter of water for asparagus as compared to the subsistence highland agriculture. However, as explained in the video, going back to the pineapple, it's only $75 that goes to the plantation workers. And of course, the 180 US dollars per 1,000 cubic meters stays with the subsistence farmers. But now let's go to the details of the calculations that be are behind these numbers. These are a lot of numbers, and I'll explain some of the important things here. Well, first of all, let's make a connection with the VAPOR program. As the VAPOR program uh, tries to make much better estimates of production and of water use. Because what we did in this calculations, which you see here, uh, the water consumption in line, uh, in this line, that is just calculated with aqua crop of FAO. This is a rough estimation, but it's not based on the actual weather conditions in that area at that time, and it's a rough calculation. Also, the um, average production here, that's an estimate from literature. That is not a real calculated or real observed um, production. And actually for all the numbers you see here, the, it's very good to realize that there are uh, certain margins of uncertainty. For example, the prices cost of inputs and the prices you get for your produce, that depends on market prices. So they can go up and they can go down and they can be different from, from different places. Also the labor requirement, that is very important because employment, that is actually where you see that the pro poor water productivity makes impact. If you have more employment, then the money is distributed over more, let's say, relatively poor people. But it's not only the plantation workers, it's also people in higher up or down the production chain. So we have people that work in factories making fertilizer. But we have also people working in uh, package plants. But it's very difficult to attribute uh, hours or days of work to one product. So in a packing station, for example, you might have different products that are being packed there. And the asparagus are only one. So in the literature you can find rough estimations, let's say that uh, for each uh, full-time laborer in the field, you might have 30% more labor generated in the transport and packaging. But that's a rough estimation. So actually, um, it's very good to take into account that these numbers are estimations. But we see another important thing in this table. Until now, and in the video, we have talked about asparagus, which are in this column. Remember the 75 US dollars per 1,000 cubic meters of water being consumed. But if you compare now to table grapes, also grown in the Ica Valley, 200 US dollars for the workers. Actually, that means that table grapes generate more income for poor people as compared to the potatoes in the highland very different from the asparagus. Why? Basically, 
because of the number of jobs being created much higher in table grapes. And that is because we have this um, labor of picking the grapes and uh, all sort of manual labor being needed for pruning and selection of the grapes. Also when we compare for example the potatoes with the maize in the highland, we see that yes the potatoes they generate a fair amount of income for the poor people, whereas we compare it to the maize, it's much less. So actually, when we compared the numbers in the video, we compared, let's say, uh, the potatoes with the asparagus. If we would have compared the corn with the table grapes, the conclusion would have been very different. So it's very important to be specific about the sort of crops and cultivation systems we are talking about. Okay, let's now go to a second example in the Taupo Valley in Colombia. So this is a production system that is dominated by sugarcane. And in the previous webinar, we have looked into sugarcane and a lot of details about uh, water productivity of sugarcane. And now we can look at a specific case where the social economic water productivity um, leads to quite some tension. So let's see. So we have sugarcane, and that is the crop that you will see most in the Cauca Valley. But we also have organic rice that's being grown by smallholder farmers. And we have cocoa. These are small plots by poor farmers in mixed fields with, mixed with other fruits. And actually in this Cauca Valley there's a struggle for water. It's a struggle about the legitimacy of sugarcane. What you see is that in the last decades, sugarcane has expanded. Because sugarcane did not always dominate the Cauca Valley, but because of several projects reclaiming land, which were wetlands before, now sugarcane has expanded. You can also see that the land and the water and the sugar industry is concentrated in the hands of few families. Those are well-known families and yeah, they have become very rich by controlling the land, the water and the sugarcane industry. What you can also see from the political point of view is that there is something like the elite capture of the state. That the regional government has several regulations that favor sugarcane production. For example, in the ethanol regulations and also in the exemption of paying taxes. What is the problem related to water? The main problem is the extraction of groundwater to irrigate sugarcane. And this affects wetlands. So this area uh, used to be actually a very big wetland and still there are parts of uh, very important wetlands with high biodiversity. But as the groundwater table is lowering because of the over extraction or irrigation of sugarcane, you will see that the wetlands dry up and the biodiversity goes down. There's also a social struggle over land and water. Actually, the indigenous population that lives in the hills surrounding the Taupa Valley, they have been uh, in a struggle for decades over control of the land and over the water. And because of climate change, we see that there is a, a increasing need to irrigate also the lands in the hills, but also the sugarcane needs more water. And you see that the struggle for land and water intensifies. So now let's look at the pro-poor water productivity or the socio-economic productivity. Um, in the same manner as we did with the Ica case. So you see that there's this productivity of land uh, per hectare, the added value, or say the net returns, and for sugarcane they are double as compared with rice and cocoa of the smallholder farmers. So this is important politically because these this numbers are used by the regional government to say, okay, we have to stimulate sugarcane because it produces two times more economic growth or economic benefit. And actually it's true. So you can say, okay, from 
the perspective of stimulating economic growth or economic uh, production, it makes sense to stimulate sugarcane. If we look now at water productivity, so let's say the same added value, but now per cubic meter of water being evaporated, we see that uh, for sugarcane we have almost uh, one US dollar when the sugar is used for uh, sugar for consumption and almost uh, 50 cents of a uh, US dollar when the sugar cane is used to produce ethanol. And for rice, that is a little bit more than 50 cents, and for cocoa, it's a little bit less. But here I have to say that we actually uh, came across a big challenge, because cocoa is not irrigated. So how are we going to, to calculate or estimate the productivity of water in cocoa? Do we calculate the precipitation be taken up and used, evaporated by the crops? Or do we uh, calculate the marginal returns, so the extra returns, if we would irrigate the cacao plantations in a dry year? And another thing is that um, the cacao is grown in mixed fields with other fruits. So it's very difficult to calculate water productivity per hectare. We can calculate it per tree and then make an estimation how the productivity would be if we would have a monoculture plantation, but we don't have it. So we have to make quite some assumptions to make these calculations. It's important to take that into account. And when you present the numbers, it should also be explained how you calculate them. Because there's a lot of choices you have to make. Now, when we go to the pro-poor water productivity or socioeconomic water productivity, you can see that in the sugarcane, only six cents of a dollar per cubic meter go to the workers. And that's even less when the sugarcane is harvested mechanically, which is now increasingly being done. Also, that point is very important in the discussion, because you might say, OK, from a social point of view, if you are a politician and you say, I want to re reduce poverty in this Cauca Valley, I should stimulate manual harvesting of sugarcane. But actually, it's a very terrible job to do. It's much better to do it mechanically. So there is these trade-offs which are difficult and should be discussed. Then for rice, the same thing. So it's 25 cents of a dollar per cubic meter of water, which goes to uh, the poor people working in the rice fields, or 20 when the rice is harvested mechanically. And in Kokawa, actually, it's the highest. So from a social point of view, being a politician that wants to reduce um, poverty in the Kauka Valley, you should stimulate cocoa production, as that gives the highest return on cubic meter of water being evapotranspirated. But now we have seen two examples where actually the subsistence agriculture is more productive in terms of uh, reducing poverty. However, we have also come across some uh, issues that actually make the whole discussion on global water productivity or socioeconomic productivity quite complex. And I think that's very good to highlight that, because otherwise we think, OK, well, the conclusion is very clear. We should stimulate um, smallholder production or peasant production because it has a higher pro-poor water productivity. Whereas actually the situations can be uh, locally very complex. Now some points for discussion and to take into account are you have to take into account the ecological effects. For example also including in that the energy being used for pumping of water. So different Farming systems have different energy use and also have different effects, for example, on pollution of water, something we call the gray water footprint also, and that is not taken into account in these indicators. And we'll see later on that um, if you make a framework, you will use, if you make a framework on different aspects of water productivity, 
as Maria will uh, explain later on, you have to use different types of indicators. So this goes to this complexity of uh, water management and economic processes in the sense that if you try to capture these indicators in one number, then uh, you don't take into account the differences you encounter over time because prices change and evapotranspiration changes and uh, labor input changes and perhaps uh, with some more precise data from BAPOR we can uh, reduce the uncertainties but still there will be always uncertainties and fluctuations over time. Um, the third point to take into account and that's very important when we relate the indicators of SDG 6.4, the first indicator looking at efficiency and the second indicator looking at the water that is used for um, ecosystem services, then we see that actually the return flows might diminish when you increase the productivity. So actually there we have a relation that is not always favorable in the sense that if I increase the efficiency, I will have more water for nature. It's not always true, because if I have more land or I can intensify the crops with higher irrigation application efficiency, so perhaps also higher water productivity, I capture more water and I produce more, but I also might diminish my return flow. What became also clear, for example, from the Colombian case is the cultural values that are not expressed in the numbers in the sense that the indigenous population is in a struggle for water because they attach different values on water on their lands compared to the sugarcane uh, companies and the sugarcane farmers. This social value should also be taken into account but can not be expressed in the numbers. So if you go to the economic numbers, it's also good to look outside agriculture. So agriculture is an important user of water, but sometimes the alternatives for using water, so the pro poor water productivity, can be higher for water use outside agriculture. And also there it's important to see who actually benefits most. Is it uh, poor people or is it uh, rich investors? And finally, um, if you talk about pro poor water productivity or socioeconomic water productivity, it's about the distribution of costs and benefits. So remember again the pineapple. If only 4% of the retailer price goes, or the consumer, consumer price goes to the workers, then um, we have to think if that percentage perhaps can be larger. And also what is the, the actually quality of the jobs that are being created. So many questions adding to the complexity of water productivity here. And with that, I want to end for now. We will come back to these discussion points and head over to Maria to explain the water productivity assessment framework. Thanks, thanks, Jeroen. Thank you also for the nice presentations. Uh, so I'm going to discuss a bit how we try to assess all these different uh, indicators that uh, Jeroen was mentioning in a, a more uh, holistic assessment of uh, water productivity. So. Um, as we also have seen in the previous webinars, uh, water productivity has both technical and social aspects. And uh, when we talk about the technical aspects, of course, we might focus in biophysical water productivity and land productivity, which are expressed in biomass and yield in terms of um, uh, water that is consumed and land uh, cultivated. But then, the other social indicators that uh, we, we decided to include in this framework is uh, the concept and the, the indicator of economic water productivity, food security, food self-sufficiency, equity and employment related to also what Jeroen was, was uh, showing us through his research and environmental and su sustainability. I think it's it's also important to note that the national governments are also focusing on these aspects and uh, use them in their policy um, 
plans and goals and especially nowadays food self-sufficiency it's 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 increasingly getting more and more uh, attention because of the COVID-19 uh, and yeah and then now what what we try to do is to compare different development strategies and how how these strategies score against all these indicators and set this uh, as a basis for a discussion and uh, the main reason that we think that this is uh, a good idea is that we can show trade-offs between different uh, development strategies and not not to say which strategy is better but rather to to make make clear the, those trade-offs and make conscious and informed decisions that are also uh, make decisions more transparent. Uh, so uh, in order to, to test our framework we decided to focus on the two, two commonly used agricultural development strategies. Uh, I think also in the previous uh, webinars as well as now we, we, we came across with this vertical and horizontal expansion in agriculture. Uh, both of these strategies have different aims, so the vertical expansion aims at maximizing agricultural production on existing land, um, but this sometimes is, comes also with m more water use. On the other side, horizontal expansion uh, focuses on expanding the agricultural area. So in order to firstly assess how the um, how the, the two indicators, the two technical indicators uh, score between those two development strategies. It's, it's nice to, to refer to the, to the graph here. Uh, what we see is that after there is a critical point after which water productivity uh, increases. So with more, with more yield, uh, water productivity decreases. And, uh, we assume that this is something that normally happens in vertical expansion as the main focus is to maximize uh, yield. For this reason, uh, we assume that uh, water productivity in, uh, in the horizontal expansion uh, is higher than water productivity in uh, vertical expansion. Uh, in terms of land productivity, it makes sense that uh, since more land is cultivated under the horizontal expansion, uh, um, the, 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 the indicator in, um, uh, yeah, the land productivity of vertical expansion scores higher compared to land productivity of horizontal expansion. Um, since land productivity in, in vertical expansion has more more uh, more crops per unit of land, and then we can assess um, we can assess the other indicators, the social indicators, and I think it's very important to note that uh, all these indicators, in order to assess them, there is a it is necessary to know the objectives that are behind these strategies and as Jeroen showed, these objectives might not necessarily uh, be met in real life. Uh, so there is also a need to go more in detail on how this, these strategies are going to, are, are taking place in, uh, in reality. So in our hypothetical example, uh, we assume that the vertical expansion uh, focuses more on food security, on on producing um, more 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 food for local consumption, while in the horizontal expansion, uh, the focus is m more on exports of high-value crops that uh, are considered to increase economic water productivity and increase the employment opportunities opportunities for people and thus also provide more income that can be spent, spent on food and thus increase the food security. So in, in order to visualize all these trade-offs that I, I was talking about, 
we use the spider diagram as you can see here. Uh, that's the ultimate goal of it is to make those trade-offs explicit and um, the scores that we assign to, to, to the different indicators as you see in the polygons of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 it's, it's, uh, it's not something that is absolute, it's rather uh, a way for us and for policymakers to discuss and uh, reveal these trade-offs. For example, what does it mean, uh, how, how these two different development strategies uh, differ in terms of biophysical uh, water productivity or environmental sustainability. Uh, and with this, I think I will uh, give the floor again to Jeroen to, to discuss uh, a bit the, the final points. Yes. yes, thank you, Maria. So the idea is to have uh, several points for discussion. I think we have already uh, presented some of those. But um, just to start the discussion, I think it's good to have a sort of recap um, I think the most important discussion when we want to use this for what productivity is to understand when we can use it. It's not that in every case it is useful to make a comparison. For example, um, it's not useful to use to compare, for example, the, the water productivity of uh, a crop in the Netherlands and say the potatoes in the Netherlands with potatoes in Peru as water from the Netherlands cannot be transported to Peru economically. So it doesn't make sense. So you can only compare uh, within a watershed or within a water irrigation system where actually uh, some managers or policy makers or farmers can make the decision to allocate water from one crop or one group of people to another group. Or that in time you can say, okay, we had sugarcane, we now we, we do a technical intervention or social intervention and we get a new situation and we can, can compare before and after according to the pro-poor or the uh, socio-economic water productivity. So we have to keep that in mind. Um, then on the technical side, and I think that is interesting to, to really think how can you calculate the evaporative transpiration uh, that is coming from irrigation and which comes from precipitation. Because that makes a difference. Because we cannot change much about the precipitation, but we can change uh, our policies and our technology regarding irrigation. So actually we are interested in the, let's say, the marginal returns in productivity of changing something in irrigation. And the precipitation is just there. And that is, from a technical point of view, not so easy to uh, put in this equitation uh, when we calculate water productivity and global water productivity. Another thing from the social point of view and the economic point of view is what labor to include in the value chain. Because it's not only the workers, like I said, it's also the people in the packing stations or people working in the factory, uh, making fertilizers, transport. But actually, if you go further away, upstream and downstream in the value chain, you will encounter more people. But their uh, jobs are to a much lesser extent related to the, that crop production. But that's, that's a difficult thing. And then actually, when I did this presentation for uh, people working in the industry, that is where they uh, questioned more. Well, it looks like we lost the video feed for Yerun in the middle of his discussion, but maybe he can join us uh, back in a in a few minutes. I see I see his name's back on. So Yerun, can you hear us? Mm -hmm. I can hear you. Yeah, some the connection went down. I'm sorry for that. Okay, we can hear you. So if you would like to continue your discussion points, we're we're happy to listen. <laughs> okay, yeah, sorry for the technical. Something went wrong with the internet connection. I don't know what. So, uh, let me start this with this last, this last point. So, um, I presented this uh, framework of uh, proper water productivity 
with people working in the industry in Peru. And what they most questioned was uh, the labor being generated throughout the whole production or value chain. Uh, I applied a 0 0.3 uh, factor to the amount of people working in the field to represent all the people working in the rest of the value chain. But, but the people in the industry said, no, that must be much higher. We generate much more employment outside the plantations. That is something to, to look into, because that matters a lot. Double amount of people would benefit from the production, then also, of course, the social water productivity would double. Um, yeah, and then it's not only the amount of employment being generated, it's also the quality of the jobs. A lot of the work in the field is quite uh, difficult jobs, hard, under harsh conditions, like uh, in sugarcane plantations do, doing the harvesting. So should we upkeep those jobs because that is uh, good for the proper water productivity? So we have to discuss about that. And then the last point to discuss is really Okay, this is, might be a nice indicator, but it's very difficult to get all the data. You saw the table of the amount of uh, data you need, and uh, a lot of this data is difficult to get, and also has a high margin of uncertainty. Um, I think that CalPOR uh, database can help, at least with having more precise data on evapotranspiration in real time, and also the production, but still then on the other uh, data, we still also need to be underground and well, uh, through interviews with key stakeholders, get those data. So it's not easy. Okay, I want to thank you for your attention and uh, we are curious to see all your questions. I already saw some questions, but yeah, let's open the floor for everybody to put their questions in the chat. Well, thank you, Jeroen, and thank you, Maria. I think those were really nice presentations, and you brought us from the beginning as to what is social and economic and socioeconomic water productivity um, to a final methodology for figuring out how to analyze them. So I think we had a couple questions in the chat, and we will bring those up on the screen. And please, if you have more questions, also put them in the chat. We'll, we'll add them um, later on in the question and answer session. Uh, so the first, uh, well, I guess it's a statement. Uh, I think sometimes the concept of water use is misleading when it doesn't mean actual evapotranspiration. Maybe, Arun, you can comment on that? You might be muted. Yeah. So that's a good point. Yeah, so that we, in the calculations, we uh, used uh, an approximation of the actual water trans evapotranspiration by using um, aqua crop. Uh, like I said, it would be good to have more precise data if that could be generated with CAPO. Um, although, in some specific cases, and therefore it's so important to really go in depth about the case studies, water being applied to the field not used by the crop is lost anyway. For example, if it drains to a saline aquifer or if it drains just directly in a river that runs into the sea. Um, in that sense, um, it might be important to actually look at all the water being applied and not only the actual effort for transpiration. It really depends on the case. It's a, a very important point to take into account. Thank you. Uh, the next question from Simon. How do you also consider home consumption or fodder for livestock, for example, for the maize example in the highlands calculation? Yeah, so in this case, we did not take that into account. What we just calculated is the total production of corn or maize uh, in the subsistence system and apply the local market price for that and calculate the net income. Uh, but yes, it would be interesting to see if if this corn is being used for livestock as fodder, then perhaps the added value is higher, and also then the water productivity, or the, the socioeconomic water productivity becomes higher. So that's a very good point, yes. The next question from Hank. Is another indicator for water productivity not also the cost of the water supply? 
for instance, if the cost of a well reduces by 50%, productivity increases, right? Yeah, so I would not say it's an indicator for water productivity, but it is one of the costs uh, of the inputs. So yes, indeed, when the cost of water is reduced, then the economic water productivity increases, not by 50%. Uh, because there are a lot of costs being made, not only the water, also the fertilizer, the land preparation, the harvest, the transport. Uh, a lot of uh, inputs might be applied, a lot, of, a lot of costs, and usually the cost of water is only a minor part of the total input costs, but yes, uh, you're right, if one of these costs is reduced, can be, for example, the water, but any other input, if you reduce the prices, if you reduce the costs, and the productivity goes up if your total production stays the same. Uh, Great, thank you. Uh, I guess a follow-up <laughs> uh, from Simon. Thank you for the framework explanation, very insightful. Did I understand correctly that vertical expansion contributes less to water productivity improvement than horizontal expansion? Maybe another yeah. question for Maria. Yeah, uh, I think I think it's probably I didn't uh, explain it correctly that uh, it's not that it does, but it's just it's a matter of where we are in the curve. So uh, if we have uh, if we are in the vertical expansions, that expansion and more water use. Uh, contributes to more more uh, water productivity, then of course it, it it can increase water productivity. But when we are in the flatter part of the curve, then it uh, it it decreases water productivity. And I think this also uh, relates to Abel's uh, um, comments. I think so. It's it's this trade-off, and that's exactly why we need to have uh, more. Uh, solid understanding of the system that we are talking about. In this case that I present the hypothetical example, we we just assume that we were in the flatter part of the curve. Uh, yeah. Great, thanks for clarifying that. It seems like that diagram is something really interesting and maybe we'll discuss it a little bit more. Um, but moving on to our next question, from a socioeconomic point of view, what are the tools that can help in mainstreaming the water productivity within the water, within the agricultural water management? Yes. Um, yeah, mainstreaming, I would say it starts from uh, the local pol political and policy context in the sense that, um, for example, in Peru, this uh, project to divert water to the coast, it was first highly supported by the regional government and the national government because of the argument that the water would be more productive and generate more economic income in the coast. But actually the project has not been built, has not been executed. Why? Because after the discussion on social water productivity, the people in the highland had more arguments saying that actually, yes, they, are, they use the water for subsistence agriculture, but actually their their socio-economic water productivity is higher. And that was an important argument for them to go to the regional government and say, okay, we don't want to have this project because we need the water here. It also has to do with new insight from climate change that says that actually the policy in Peru is now also to support highland farmers to start the irrigation, whereas they had rain-fed agriculture before. So the social economic point of view can be mainstreamed um, in the discussion on policy decisions, but it, I think it's very case-specific. Great, thank you for discussing that. It seems like this is a concept that's gaining popularity around the world. Would you say that, Yarun, as, as more as water productivity and the socioeconomic factors around it become more of a mainstream topic? Yes, I think there's not much de detailed studies being done on uh, calculations of social economic water productivity. There's one very good PhD thesis being done uh, in space. Uh, 
uh, on groundwater use in Spain uh, done uh, by a PhD student uh, at the Complutense University in Madrid. That uh, is online and uh, we can share the link to that. I was not involved there. I just encountered that looking for other studies. And I think that is a very elaborate case study. So you might have, uh, you might be interested to look into that. Great, and we can provide that link um, either through the website or in the chat, so that would be really interesting. Uh, okay, next question. Have you tried using the gender lens when you look at the... Maria, you want to answer that? No, no, no. Yeah, no I, th I think it's a good question. Actually, again, I would say uh, if this is an issue specifically, let's say that, for example, um, for example, in the table grapes in, in Peru, it's mainly women working, and in asparagus, it's mainly men. So actually, yeah, you can make this distinction and say, okay, if you want to have poverty reduction uh, among women, then in Peru, you should have a policy favoring the production of table grapes. Whereas, if you if you don't mind, then uh, asparagus might be uh, good as well. So yes. You can apply it not only to gender, but it can be also different social groups. You can identify who profits from, who gains employment, who gains income from a certain production system, and then calculate how much that is compared to the water input. And you can do that for gender, or you can do that for any other uh, groupings you want to make uh, from the social point of view. Very nice. Uh, our next question comes from Frank. Can, some, can you somehow include more indirect costs in some sort of water productivity indicator? For example, diverting water to irrigated agriculture leads to wetlands degradation that causes downstream events of flooding and droughts that lead to additional costs for society. Yeah, I think that's a very nice question. And that depends on the, the basic question, if you think that you can convert all those uh, issues into economic terms. If you can say, okay, a flooding event has certain costs, a drought has certain costs, then you can calculate them in so, some sort of an indicator to relate them to water productivity. But of course, flooding and droughts also have immaterial or non-economic effects, like on the ecosystem, on birds or whatever. So it's not that you can always calculate everything in economic terms. And then it might then it becomes very difficult to use these sort of indicators. So I think it is important to look into the issues of, for example, also water quality, pollution, like in the water uh, footprint calculations, they came up with the idea of the gray water footprint that somehow uh, quantifies the water quality issue. And you could also try to do that with flooding and drought events. But it's not easy, and I think, again, it would be case specific. Um, and just a follow up question would that be something that could be captured in those spider diagrams? That yeah, Marie definitely. Uh, the, 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 the framework is open for a uh, for additions, and I think that's also the possibility that you can pretty much easily include different indicators. And I think also in the environmental sustainability, everyone can define it more specifically and uh, have more more focus. So uh, yeah, that's that's nice. Great. Okay, next question, also from Hank. Uh, regarding Netherlands as an example, 100 years ago, all farmers had their own wealth. Water was for domestic use, but also for chickens, cows, and their garden. So water for food security. Does the same logic not also apply for developing countries? So should programs not focus on... Yes. Uh one, one of the indicators is, let's say, for example, also water security, apart from, let's say, employment in the, in the framework. Um, so then you could separate them. Um, the other thing is then, again, I would say this is case specific. If it is important that people have access to their own wells or their own pumps um, for water security reasons, 
then it would not be good to just make calculations on profits and employment because this goes beyond that. Um, for food security, that is not always related to the money you can make inside your own plot or outside. That really depends. I mean, in Peru, uh, people migrate from the mountains to the coastal areas looking for jobs. So if they can make money there, uh, they can send their children to school. So if that is of their interest, then they might not be so interested in the water security in their home villages. But in other situations, it might be crucial to first secure water uh, in the homesteads of people in their own fields and then look how, food, how water could be employed um, effectively in commercial agriculture. I would say actually that is always case specific and but very important to take into account. I think uh, it, these questions are really highlighting the importance of doing a, a case-specific study and looking at um, not only the economic factors around a particular river basin or irrigated area, but also the social conditions. And it's hard to make blanket statements about these types of things. So um, yeah, really, really important work that you guys are doing and, and nice framework that you've developed. I think it'd be interesting to see more examples as it gets applied uh, further on in this project and other projects that you're working on. Uh, a question from David. In an area where we have more evaporation, so in the tropics, do you think that actual ETA is the best estimate of water use, or should there be other considerations? I think this might have been a question for Marluce, who's uh, also on our IHE Delft, uh, the water pit project team. Um, and she, I mean, Abraham, maybe you want to bring her as a presenter, but in the chat she commented that actual evapotranspiration from remote sensing does provide a lot of spatial information on water use, which is not available elsewhere. So maybe we can, yeah, Marlis has joined as a presenter. I don't know if she wants to comment on that any further. Yeah, no, I think it's a very interesting question. And like I said in the chat, that uh, had the, the remote sensing ET does provide a lot of information, spatial information, water use. What are the, con the considerations? Uh, one consideration is that in areas where there's a lot of cloud cover, um, the actual ET values uh, have problems. Um, so in, in his case, uh, he's talking about uh, dry areas, you, you probably have a lot of clear skies, so the ETs will be, uh, will be uh, the estimate will be very good. Uh, another consideration also that uh, it also provides a lot of uh, natural uh, evaporation, um, and we shouldn't uh, put that as a loss or something, and, and maybe cut forests because we want to reduce evaporation in the natural landscape. So we need to uh, keep that into consideration when we're talking about the actual ET, the consumption of the landscape. Uh, Thanks for that clarification. And I think we have one final question that has been submitted. Um, if you have more, now is the time to put them in the chat box. But <laughs> um, from the Peru example, social water productivity of asparagus can be improved by boosting the wages of plantation workers through industrial action slash sociopolitical intervention. So is SWP an indicator water Well, that's a, that's a good observation, a good question. Yes, so the, if the wages go up, then the, the social water productivity goes up. And that is one action the, the activists could take, uh, or trade workers' unions could uh, strive for, which is also happening. And also the wages have gone up, which influences this local water productivity. Um, and actually the wages go up much faster than the prices at the local markets. So you see that actually it becomes more attractive to grow and work in these plantations. If you see the number of avocados being sold in Dutch supermarkets, it's incredible. And they, they are, uh, a lot of those are produced in the coastal areas of Peru. But actually what 
we think is the most useful uh, application of this propol water productivity is in discussion with policymakers about what policies should they uh, implement regarding water productivity. For example, what happens if you have a project that stimulates drip irrigation uh, for uh, subsistence agriculture, like is also happening in Peru? Then you could use indicators to see what is actually happening and who is profiting from that and what will happen with the water flow. Um, also, for example, in the Colombian case, when there is um, the subsidies for the sugarcane factories and for the sugarcane producers, then you can show, okay, this is um, legitimized because of the high productivity, but that's the high productivity for uh, calculated or uh, on basis of land area and not of water use and not especially not the pro poor uh, water use. So in that case, it influences or it can influence policy making, and that is I think the most important way to use these indicators. Thank you. I actually have a, a question for Maria. I, I can use my, <laughs> my position as moderator. But I would be curious to hear more about how the discussions go for figuring out the um, relative values in the spider diagrams. So it said in your presentation you bring people together and you have discussions. So maybe what information or data do they use in those discussions and how do they do? Yeah. So far, we are still at the beginning of this uh, framework, but uh, it's true. It's it's more like uh, you understand what people like, what people think is most important. So uh, so far, we also don't have uh, precise or uh, concrete research that shows. Uh, so the idea is that policymakers are are. Uh, discussing and then through these discussions more more of their interest and what it is important for for the particular context or particular uh, groups is what is mo most important so uh, so the the scores is it's not it's what it matters to who so it's everything is uh, relative I would say brings together the best available data and, and people's knowledge of, of a particular situation to arrive at those values. Great, thank you. I appreciate the clarification. Um, I think we have one more question. Can social water Yeah, thank you, Abeba, for the nice question. I think that needs further thinking. I wouldn't know how to do it. I know that, well, with, with the discussion on the water footprint uh, worldwide, there has been this uh, mapping of connecting water footprint with uh, water scarcity in each region of the world. And that's interesting because, of course, if you, in a very wet area, uh, have a very large footprint for producing a certain uh, good, that doesn't matter, there's water sufficient anyway, right? In a water scarce situation, it's much more important to know what your water footprint is. Um, so the social water productivity could be linked to that, but, and you could also link it to, let's say, social indicators, like say a gender indicator or indicator of poverty, and then see, okay, is there a relation worldwide between um, social water productivity and uh, poverty, for example? And then you would draw much more to the to the social side. I don't know if it is really relevant in the sense that, like I said before, it only makes sense to compare socioeconomic water productivity within one watershed or within one irrigation system. Because you cannot transport water over the world. It is only a policy issue or management issue within a watershed. There you can make the decision whom will get the water, what production. And that is, so then I don't know how you can relate that to water scarcity and 
compare different river basins, if that makes sense. It would be interesting to, to do an exercise. Maybe you want to, to help in that, uh, Abele. It's a nice opportunity to, to recruit more people to help you on your projects. <laughs> um, and I think one more question. Yes, uh, so I think also like um, employment and uh, women employment can be related directly with women empower empowerment in the spider diagram, but I think the diagram is op open for also other indicators and uh, uh, if, if we can find a way to uh, make a more concrete assessment of what, what other ways we can um, uh, assess the woman empowerment, then of course we can include it in the framework. And uh, yeah. No. Yes, and I, I guess it's also like, uh, of course, um, so through policy analysis you can always uh, see what a national government or uh, a particular region wants to address with different interventions, what are their goals, and then based on these goals uh, discuss uh, how they score. So if, if a particular group wants women empowerment, then this is something that can also be added in the framework. Very nice, thank you. Well, I think with that, we have answered all the questions either from the panel or in the chat. So I would like to thank our presenters today. Uh, really nice, clear, informative presentations on the topic. And I would like to thank everyone in the chat who engaged with us and introduced themselves and asked questions. Um, really encouraging to see how engaged people are in this topic. So thank you again to everyone. Uh, one final thing I would like to say, when you exit the webinar, you will be sent to a page for a survey that helps us figure out who our audience is and what you are interested in learning more about. So if you have already completed the survey, you did your job, thank you very much. If you are new or have not yet completed it, we would really appreciate it if you could do that. It, it helps.